If you are taking Xeralto or Rivaroxaban for atrial fibrillation stroke prevention or know somebody who is, you or they are more likely to experience a debilitating stroke or have a dangerous bleeding episode more so than if you're to be taking Apixaban or Eliquis. In this video, I'm going to share with you some new important information on blood thinners for atrial fibrillation that you may want to discuss with your family doctor or heart specialist. Hello again, it's Herb the Heart Pharmacist, where I help you understand the nuances of heart medication so you can choose and use wisely. Over the last 10 to 15 years or so, doctors have been given the choice to lower the stroke risk for patients with atrial fibrillation using these direct acting oral anticoagulants or DOACs rather than warfarin because each of them have been shown that they are not worse than warfarin and in some cases may even be better for stroke prevention without carrying a higher bleeding risk. However, one of the biggest hurdles in this area of research and practice is that we never had a good comparison head to head in a large randomized trial for any of these agents. So doctors were given the freedom to choose any of these blood thinners depending on their patient's individualized needs and preferences, uh, such as if they only want to take a pill once a day because of pill burden or their kidney function isn't so good or possible drug interactions with other medications that they're taking. We've also known that a large randomized head-to-head -head comparison of these agents will never really ever happen because there's just simply no money to be made by industry uh, to go through such an arduous process, an expensive process, just to figure out which one is the best out of the four. Rather, they would try to move on to discovering new drugs that could possibly be better, such as the factor 11 inhibitors that are being studied currently. Over the last five to 10 years, I've been paying close attention to whatever information has been coming out um, pertaining to these DOACs just because I've long suspected that they're not actually that equal. As anecdotally, I would see more patients come into the hospital with a stomach or intestinal bleed or a breakthrough stroke while being on Xeralto. I have been noticing too that more and more of the observational registry based data that's been coming out is that it's been suggesting that they're not equal as well. One of my favorite phrases in my line of work is one that I heard from Dr. John Mandrola on his podcast this week in cardiology from one of his colleagues. Science tells us what we can do. Trials tells us what we should do. And observational data tells us what we're actually doing. So now that the DOACs have been out on the market and people have been taking them for some time now with the first one being Xeralto in 2011 all the way to Edoxaban or Lixiana came out about 2016 or 2017 there's a decent amount of real world information to tell us what is actually happening when we put people on one DOAC versus another there have been fewer and fewer people I've noticed being put on Pradaxa or Dabigatran and there are were never really too many people put on Nadoxaban or Lixiana because it came so late in the game. So most commonly I see are Eliquis or Xeralto. I've been a bigger fan of Apixaban, mostly owing to there being less shady things done in their landmark clinical trial and the overall more favorable pharmacokinetics of the drug and possibly it being more effective than Warfarin as opposed to Rivaroxaban compared to Warfarin. We are now in 2024, and I think there are a lot of people still being put on things like Pradaxa and Xeralto. Maybe because there's some prescribers who are still influenced by industry or certain prescribers that just had better experiences with one versus another. But my goal here is not to tell you to tell your doctor to switch you over to Eliquis if you happen to be on one of the other ones. But I do encourage that you do have at least a discussion with your family doctor or cardiologist to revisit your blood thinner. If you are noticing some more nuisance bleeding like nosebleeds or bleeding gums or hemorrhoids on Xeralto, rather than doing an off-label dose reduction from 20 milligrams down to 15 if you happen to have fairly good kidney function, which is something I see in practice from time to time. But 
The idea is that you and your prescriber should both consider the possibility of being put on Eliquis or Pixaban instead. Now here are the meat and potatoes. Just a couple weeks ago, Therapeutics Initiative has published a systematic review and meta-analysis of observational cohort study data regarding DOAX for atrial fibrillation in their bi-monthly therapeutics letter, which is boldly entitled, A Pixaban is safer and more effective than Rivaroxaban for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. For those of you who are not aware, we have a group of researchers in British Columbia, Canada, as part of the university or UBC. They are called the Therapeutics Initiative. And what they are, are a group of doctors and pharmacists and researchers who are out there to seek the truth behind medications, who basically do what I do in diving into the literature and evaluating it, but doing it like 100 times better, who analyze the data on medications and evaluate them for what they truly are without the influence of industry or having that information misrepresented that can influence prescribing. The outcomes of interest include total mortality, stroke or systemic embolism, ischemic stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, and major bleeding. The amount of data that they accumulated and analyzed was over 2 million people's worth. And it's fairly impressive in my opinion. They screened 42 studies and whittled it down to 27 studies that were deemed suitable for their meta-analysis. For those of you who are not familiar with what a meta-analysis is, it's basically analyzing and pooling data from various smaller studies to see if a larger signal or trend tends to surface when you combine more information together to create something that's more statistically robust. Unfortunately, Adoxaban did not come to the market until later, so there wasn't enough information on it for them to confidently evaluate the safety and effectiveness profile compared to the three other DOACs. After painstakingly tabulating the data for over 2 million patients, they found the following. Those who were taking a Pixaban had about a 14% lower risk of dying compared to Rivaroxaban. There was actually no difference between a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban for blood clots traveling to the brain or the rest of the body. Those who were taking a Pixaban had about a 25% lower risk of a blood clot wedged into the brain causing an ischemic stroke while also having a 24% lower risk of having a brain bleed over rivaroxaban. Those who were receiving a pixaban also had a 38% lower risk of developing a major bleeding episode, typically defined as bleeding that required hospitalization, an emergency room visit, transfusions, or bleeding in a critical part of the body. I didn't go over the comparison between Apixaban and Dabigatran for the same outcomes because most people aren't really taking Dabigatran nowadays anyway. But if you are curious to know and don't mind doing some reading yourself, I have included the link to this therapeutics initiative letter that includes the meta-analysis in the comments below. So about this publication, obviously being a retrospective study in nature, Looking back at this data, we can never really confidently establish causality like we can from a large prospective randomized clinical controlled trial. There is always a chance of confounding or factors that sway certain patients to perform worse or better over another um, that we don't have control over, like education level, for example, where some of these people may be better educated and their understanding of the importance of health and other aspects of their lives and taking medications and their diet could influence the outcomes. One thing that I would like to add with regards to this paper analysis is that it doesn't really talk about the doses that were prescribed for each of these agents. And we do know that some patients are actually underprescribed or have a dose reduction because they or their doctor have decided that the risk for bleeding, for example, is too high for them. I literally just had a discussion with one of my patients with cardiac amyloidosis and atrial fibrillation where they asked me whether they should be reducing their dose of apixaban because of skin tears and bleeding. I basically said, given what we know about the risk for stroke in not only atrial fibrillation, but also cardiac amyloidosis in itself, 
that we should try to do what we can to minimize the risk of skin tears by either moisturizing the skin on a regular basis, particularly after a shower or bath, rather than chancing it with a debilitating stroke. Problem two is that for patients who have cardiac amyloid, can also have those amyloid proteins deposit in the blood vessels, making them more prone to bleeding as well. So it's a very tough position to be in, and I understand that. So I encourage them to connect with their usual heart doctor um, and amyloid specialist to see if they should do a dose reduction of the apixaban. I suspect that they won't. Overall, this paper is consistent with what I've been seeing in my practice and what I've been reading about regarding the real world data that's been coming out for DOACs in atrial fibrillation. And this was a huge study. So it does provide me some comfort and more certainty for somebody who's been advocating for putting patients on Pixaban rather than Rivaroxaban over the years. If you are wondering about the intricacies of why my preference for uh, DOAC is not Rivaroxaban, check out this video here where I go over why you should not be taking Rivaroxaban at breakfast. Lastly, I'd like to apologize for how long it's taken for me to um, upload another video. It's been simply too difficult with teaching and the, the demands of work and being a parent and everything that it's uh, that I kind of fell off the bandwagon and it's um, something that I'm not very happy about. I'm hoping that this will be a better start to the new year for me and that I can continue sharing some of these things that I've found and that I've been learning about and in hopes that you will uh, learn as well and also benefit from uh, having these discussions with your doctors as well. This is something I love doing and I don't want it to ever really stop. Yeah, so I'm just kind of getting back up on the horse now and trying to push through. I appreciate all the comments, the likes, the shares, and you hitting the subscribe buttons. Um, it means a lot to me, and I thank you from the bottom of my apex. Say no to drugs.